There we go. Welcome to What If Season 1, Episode 2, What If T'Challa Became a Star Lord. Thoughts. Now, spoilers for the MCU leading up to this point, including this episode. I may discuss theories that might spoil upcoming episodes in this video. As usual, I recommend videos talking about Easter eggs and such on the show, especially videos made by New Rockstar, Screen Rant, Nerdist, CBR, Screen Crush, Black Nerd Comedy, and IGN. So if this is the first of these videos by me that you watch, just to get you up to speed, I love every MCU, may uh, every MCU movie, although I don't make any excuses for Iron Man 2, and I love every, every episode that's come out so far of the Disney Plus MCU shows, including this episode. Excellent pacing, like episode 1. I saw someone say that, uh, you know, episode 1 was too fast-paced. I don't know, maybe a little. I I might have a fairly high tolerance for that because I watched action movies in the early to mid 2000s. I watched Resident Evil Apocalypse in theaters, so I know, you know, yeah, I I know what fa overly fast pace for action is and it is much much faster than the yeah. Anyway, to me at least I like that Star-Lord steps in the water puddle that apparently we were seeing the Watcher in. I'm pretty sure Quill stepped in at least one puddle of water as well. I like the, again, the, the various little changes. T'Challa Star-Lord does not dance to music into the, the cave. And we find out that T'Challa Star-Lord actually is famous, which is a, a great twist. And he's like Robin Hood to them. I think that this version of Korath is a little too broad. I don't mind that they made him funny. And it's not like it's not the first time that I see Jaiman Hansu be funny. I don't need him to always be stoic badass. I just think they went a little too far with it. I I yeah, just dial it down like 20% maybe. Chadwick Boseman RIP delivers a really good performance. I said a Ravager... Yeah, I'm not going to do the accent. I said a Ravager never flies solo, and we see Yondu's arrow, so this version of Star-Lord Star really likes Yondu and gets along well with him. And we, you know, we, we saw that in the trailer, but I do just... I just... It's such a great twist. It's, it's you know... In the, in the movie, he was entirely on his own because he's kind of not great at sticking with people and that's something he gets better at over the course of the movie you know but yeah the the it it makes a lot of sense i feel like that t'challa's star lord would be a a leader from from immediately as soon as yeah and this version of yondu is also a a good person robin hood type t'challa reformed the ravagers is how some reviewers put it. And so, you know, the, the, this Yondu has all his original teeth where the, the one in the, the movie had lost a lot and, you know, had gold teeth in, in their place. And Peter Quill was mourning when he was taken by Yondu. But T'Challa wanted to explore and was actually being told not to by his father and was already leaving Wakanda. You know, it's it's unclear for how long he would have tried to stay away if not for the alien abduction. But yeah, he was like, this is amazing. And I like that, you know, one, one of the Easter egg people pointed out that Yondu, we already knew, we, we find out in Guardians Volume 2, Yondu really didn't like you know kidnapping kids for ego and because of that in this universe he outsourced the job of finding peter quill to i can't believe craglin sean gunn and craglin you know like taserface straight up like he doesn't he can't tell human beings apart which is yeah, and and I I really like Craglin's line. Like he's like, no, look, 
He's got what was it? He's got two eye holes, two ear holes, one mouth hole. And yeah, it's really fun seeing Taserface again, and he's on board with Robin Hooding. And Sean Gunn is learning quite good performance as Cracklin. I like that Korath was hired by the Ravagers, just like he said he wanted to be. You know, he's like, okay, okay, I'm I'm working for this this guy I'm working for is a total drag. He's kind of intense. I kind of have to fight you now, but you know, really big fan. And so yeah, and and afterwards, Chad is like, I've worked with worse. I was not ready to see Thanos okay to admit that his genocide plan was wrong, even though he's still like, it's not without its merits. There's at least three jokes about how he still thinks that the genocide would, you know, he's, he's not, he's accepted that he's not going to do it, but he kind of still wants to see, he, he's, like, it's, it's still in his mind, it's still on his mind. It's still something that he's going to bring up every so often. You know, as, as we see in this episode, basically every time he meets someone new, he brings it up. Some say that three jokes are too much. And yeah, I can I can kind of see, you know, I, I personally like his characterization overall. But, you know, I can understand not liking it. You know, I, I, I saw one person compare it to the Infinity Stones being paperweights in Loki, and yeah, there's definitely, <laughs> yeah, and I just, I don't know, I, I can understand it, I guess, I felt that they, they balanced it well enough, he's still a badass, he's still tough, you know, he's just, and, and, you know, some people also said that, oh, he's getting his ass kicked by the, the Black Order. I don't know. I, it, it didn't bother me. I guess he was convinced because of the existence of the Genesis device, for whatever it's worth, I thought of the comparison to the Genesis device before watching the Nerdist video where they also make that comparison. And it does make sense. I mean, the Genesis device has the potential to save countless lives, and they make it clear that they're going to give it away for free, which, of course, means that MAGA and conservative pundits are already calling it fascism. Drax is happy, so is Nebula. Significantly less trauma for them in this universe. And Drax is even a bartender, not a... You know, some, some people point out we might have thought he was going to be a Ravager, at least. But... No, he's, he's a bartender. His, you know, his wife, his two daughters are still alive. He has nothing to destroy just, or destroy for, you know, because they actually, they didn't actually call him Drax the Destroyer all that much, did they? I, th I think they call him that once in the first movie. And the collector took advantage of the power vacuum left when Thanos changed. Clever writing. I saw one person point out that basically, like, in Infinity War... When the collector has no power, he's like, you know, he's he's being extremely careful not to provoke Thanos. He's he's being very meek. But now that he has a lot of power, he is like this crime lord type. Like he's he's owning that, and that you know, and they pointed out that makes perfect sense for his character because he's an opportunist. And I would have to agree. Some people have said that Benicio Del Toro's performance is kind of weird. Maybe, yeah. I, I, I mean, he had to do something, something very different because the this is a very different collector. I can, I can understand people who say that it's it's too different, too too weird. The performances in this episode are a lot better than the performances in the first episode. Other than Haley Atwell, she was great. And the Black Order are the Collector's security force, which is a, a neat kind of, because because they're also like, you know, they they follow Thanos because he was really powerful, and he like you know, like they don't. I'm not sure they have much of an ideological, 
you know, they just, they kind of just, they work for someone who's extremely powerful and then they kind of really devote themselves to that extremely powerful person. But it's not about ideology, it's about power. And a number of the collector's boxes are suspended in the air. Excellent. Really, yeah. MCU, that is the second time that you have shown me Cosmo the Space Dog in a box. This time you had better follow through on making him more of a character. He's amazing. And he does show up again later in the episode, although based on the ending of the episode, I guess we might not see this episode again, or maybe we will just before the end of the universe of this universe. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about, like, we are two episodes in now. They haven't given either of these universes numbers, at least not in in the sh... Now, I'm, I'm almost certain they haven't. They, they didn't appear anywhere. I get it, but I just feel like if they're going to start bringing stuff back from these episodes, I don't know, are they just going to refer to the titles then? Like, in a later episode, maybe you know, T'Challa the Star-Lord comes back, or Captain Carter comes back. But, yeah, I, I guess that's how they're going to handle it. I don't know. Maybe, okay, to be fair, it might not play as well. Like, if you open a comic book and there's, like, a long line of numbers, you just kind of accept, oh, okay, you're sure. But in a in a show, and it's supposed to be more mainstream, they're supposed to have more mainstream appeal than comic books, I could see how it might be a, a little much. And maybe they also want to avoid, like, Star Trek comparisons. Like, ah, uh, Star Dates, I want to say they're called. It's been a long time since I watched Star Trek. Love seeing more Howard the Duck. And he, he quacks twice. And he's like, it's, it, he, what was it? He, he's like, it's, you know, we, we can't do this right now. It's, it's. Happy hour. You know, happy hour is almost over or something. I hope we get to see more of him in later, whether it's episodes or other, you know, or more movies or something. And he references the, you know, once you go duck, you're out of luck. And T'Challa finds a Wakandan ship in the collector's collection. There's a hologram of his father talking to him, very Superman. Again, I made that, you know, I thought of Superman before I watched Easter egg videos. And Nebula tricked T'Challa, betrayed him. I like that she has a lot less cyborg parts because the Mad Titan is a better adoptive father. You know, she's got the, the eye thing, but she's, you know, she's got, you know, luscious locks of blonde hair and, I, yeah, very... And I really like the, the flirting between her and, and T'Challa, where she calls him Cha-Cha. And I like when T'Challa realizes Yonder lied to him about Wakanda being destroyed. You're just an ordinary Earthling? You sure you can't fly, shoot lasers from your eyes? See, he sees the Superman parallels, too. And Nebula double-crosses the double-cross. It's a quadruple-cross, and... I wrote that before it was called a triple cross. And T'Challa is saved by the slave girl from Squidward. And I like that thing you said about not putting people in cages in the movie one. Her species and a former slave girl was in a cage. So, yeah. And that's apparently, like, they apparently brought back everyone to, to play their own character. You know, which, it's, it's great. It, Animation means that you can have all of these actors interact with each other without them having to be in the studio at the same time. So you can have a story like parts of this episode are like the the kind of like you you would expect to see in maybe an Avengers movie, but like they're they're so big, there's so many characters, and they can do that because their lines might have been recorded on completely separate days. And I love when the Collector brings out a bunch of weapons, including Captain America's shield. He doesn't use that, but just, you know, Hela's necro sword and the, you know, he's got, he's got a 
what was it, a dagger from one of the Black Elves, the one that Frigga, you know, the, the type of dagger that Frigga gets stabbed with, and let's see, there was Mjolnir, and, and one of these Drake people pointed out, he must have gotten his hands on that before Odin made the, the you know, what's, what's it called, the, the worthiness spell on it. I guess he sent someone, in, in this universe, the Collector sent someone to intercept Thor on Jotunheim before Odin showed up and saved him and the warriors. There's some chance that he killed Thor and the Warriors 3 and then grabbed the hammer and then left before Odin got there. That's, yeah, not crazy, mad. Mad and against Tony, stabby. And Yondu attacks the Collector, who breaks the arrow. Holy crap. I, I really loved... <laughs> That's a thing in comic books. When you want to show how big of a badass someone is, you bring in someone who's been established already to be a major badass, and then you have the new guy wipe the floor with him. And that was just... Yeah. And apparently he stole Korg's arm and is using it as a glove, like a... Like a Boxing glove, that's, yeah. It is seriously surreal to see the children of Thanos attacking Thanos. And it seems like they beat him, the Nebula rescued him, she attacks using the, the Genesis device thing. And, and you know, we see that it grows a lot of plants. I wonder if they got that idea from Hellboy too. And, you know, some of these very people point out that, like, that means that there might be like, like the the nowhere is the decapitated head of a celestial. I think they're the the celestials are the yeah, not an eternal right. Ah, and the you know does this mean that the head was brought back to life or that you know now there's it can support life? And someone else also pointed out. I mean, if all those plants grow the the as fast as we see them do. I guess they just killed everyone who was still on there, so that's kind of dark. And and the... Yeah. Okay, this episode does have at least a few too many instances of an ally showing up to rescue or provide backup for someone. And I loved hearing the Wakanda theme playing. I'm, I really love how these shows are bringing back themes, you know... Yeah, theme music from the movies, and and that, like, yeah, that just, that really works well. Uh, you know, we also had the Wakanda theme some in Captain America and the Winter Soldier, and that one also played some of the Captain America solo movie music themes, and so yeah. And I like the the sticky fingers thing. It's you know, cause yeah, like if. If the Collector is focusing on beating up Yondu, then he can't also watch if Yondu is grabbing something from his... Yeah. And Karina, the former slave girl, unleashes all of the Collector's displays and they attack him. And he even says, I put a roof over your head, which is something that apologists for slave owners actually say. I, I heard someone say that. I, I guess it's been a few years by now, but like recently. So that was... Yeah, very, very satisfying. And honestly, there's probably some percentage of the fandom of the MCU fans who've been wanting to see a scene like that since 2014, since Guardians 1. And we saw how he had imprisoned all of these living beings. Now, and, you know, was it? I think it might be Andre the Black Nerd, Black Nerd Comedy, who made the comparison to the ending of the Lion King with Scar. I suppose that's all I'm gonna say. I mean, probably everyone has watched that by now, or know what that is by cultural osmosis or something. And the Ravagers go to Wakanda. Good scene. Dad, not gonna lie, I did not see this twist on Infinity War coming at all. Like, he keeps saying... You know, like, I, I think, he, is he talking to an, 
was it was it Okoye? I'm pretty sure it was at least Adora Milaje he's talking to, and she's like, that just sounds like genocide. And he's like, no, 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 because it's random. And and then Nebula goes, Dad, like he's he's the he's the oversharing dad at the at the, just wow. Holy crap, Ego found Peter Quill and the Watcher heavily implied that in this universe in the multiverse, he is successful. And the the Yeah, you know, if if Peter Quill hadn't gone through the events of Guardians of the Galaxy One Volume One, then yeah, would he really reject Ego? I I think there's some chance that he, he would go along with it. And yeah, you know, Uatu definitely said that it led to the end of the world, so that's pro. Absolutely love this episode, one of the best MCU stories. It makes a lot of sense that Thanos would agree to the Genesis device in place of the snap before he thought that the snap was the only thing that would work. He didn't love the idea of killing half the universe. I do wonder how many times the people in charge of creative decisions of the MCU had to read online people saying that instead of the snap, he should be making more worlds and more food before they finally relented and wrote this. Let's see. But but yeah, like the the let's see the the uh, what was the you know it it makes more sense when you realize that in, in the comics he's not trying to stop you know, overpopulation and such, he's trying to impress Mistress Death, a literal physical embodiment of the concept of death, very frequently drawn as a skeleton in, in a robe, and she's female and he's trying to get her attention, and because of that he tries to kill a lot of people to say, look, I'm worthy of you now, which, you know, their Genesis device isn't really going to make any sense for him, but yeah. I don't know if the, the like the people who who came up with the idea that he was trying to stop overpopulation like the the I don't know maybe maybe there should have been a line about why a genesis device like I I sh something I've for example seen a lot of people say was why couldn't he snap his fingers and make more planets and more food with that and yeah I, you know, it maybe would have been good if there had been a line in there explaining why that just wasn't, like, honestly, yeah, like, let, let's see, would it contradict, I don't think it would contradict anything in the MCU if he just said, the, the Infinity Stones, uh, let's see, the Infinity Stones together cannot create they can remove and they can bring back something that was removed, but they can't create something out of nothing. But the... Let's see. Can any of the stones create something out of nothing? I mean, they... They can't really, can they? They work as energy sources. They can change things that are... Yeah, I don't know. Maybe they just felt that it... Maybe they couldn't find a good place to put that line. And this episode is dedicated to Chadwick Boseman, beautiful and appropriate. And let's see. Yeah, I, I like the, the heist element and the cutting back and forth. Like during the heist, you know, at one point it cuts back and we find out that Nebula the the thing of nebula betraying him that was part of the plan you know and and which also just really worked the 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 idea like when we first see her betray him we accept it because we know that you know main yeah the the i guess sacred time sacred timeline nebula yeah, she'll betray you, you know, and we've seen a lot, there are a lot of stories where, you know, 
there's a betrayal like that. But then when we later find out, like, it's such a clever, like, so she uses the fact that the collector, the collector falls for it because she does owe him. She, she is indebted to him. So he would think that she was just, you know, settling that debt. You know, it wouldn't have worked if they brought in some, if, if, he was being transported with someone who didn't owe the collector anything. It would be like, why are you betraying the guy that you work with? You know, he would he would realize it was a trap. Now, let's see. I appreciated how much action, how many... How many twists, how much action exposition it fit in, and how well it just worked. Like, I never felt like the show just stopped to give me a ton of information, which, again, I love comic books, but that can be a bit of a problem. Like, a, a new character will appear, and someone else will be like, who are you? And there'll be, like, this wall of text explaining, I am this and this, I came from here and here, I can do this and this. I'm trying to prevent this and that because this and that evil entity or person or force is is a danger. And in a comic book, it just works. You know, there are only so many pages. Sometimes you have to have just this massive exposition dump, but nobody likes it in a movie or a TV show, or not TV show, streaming show. So they, I felt like they, they managed to always, like... There, every time there would be exposition, there would be some kind of fun little, like, there would be something that would distract you so you didn't realize, oh, this is just exposition. I think it was IGN who pointed out that the animation style of the show works way better for the story than it did for the first one. You know, the, the for example, the, the colors of James Gunn's, you know, cosmic stories the the animation works really well for that and what was the yeah where the the 1940s and the the sort of the 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 setup of the like the first avenger captain Morgan one the first avenger was comparatively not the, you know it's nowhere near as bright and colorful as the the Ga guardians of the galaxy movies and yeah some have pointed out that the episode is about nature versus nurture. A lot of the characters that we knew in the previous MCU to be very hardened characters willing to do terrible things. Here are unequivocally good people. So apparently Chadwick Boseman did record voice work for more episodes of the show before his death, so he will appear in more episodes, but it may not be as the titular protagonist. And let's see, that was everything I had written down to make sure to say. I thought that they did a good job of like the action. When, when there's this many action scenes in such a short space of time, you risk them kind of just blending together. And you know, like afterwards, you can't really remember them apart from each other, which ideally an action scene you should be able to remember it apart from the other action scenes. And I think they did a good job. Like, there was enough variety. Like, the, the when, when T'Challa and Star... Yeah, when T'Challa fights Korath, for example, that feels very different from later on when, like, you have, you know, people with, with more you know, stronger superpowers. And I also, I think it might have been Black Nerd Comedy who pointed out that when Korath and T'Challa fight, we, you know, we have the, the same technology as Peter Quill, but he also has the, the you know, T'Challa's fighting prowess, which, yeah, really, really cool to see that, you know, and like, again, that's, that's, part of the point of doing these things like let's have let's take these characters and put them in this other situation and see how that plays out and let's 
you know, have have some fun with that kind of thing. And let's see, I suppose that might more or less cover right the the uh, let me think the the ship, if I recall, was like the T'Challa's ship is called like the Ma the Mandela because as you know as, you know growing up Mandela was his hero T'Challa's hero where you know Quill had named his ship the Milano after Alyssa Milano who he had a crush on growing up so that was a, a good detail as well I yeah I th I thought it was legitimately like inspired to bring like bring back the collector and then have him fighting using you know weapons from his collection and and that yeah that was really really cool and like you know I'm not sure how he got Hella's the the well, yes let's see he calls it the necro sword but it clearly includes the like the 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 crown is is part of it but yeah i you know especially let's see i mean did he yeah uh let's see i think yeah, one one thing I want to say is, you know, with both of these episodes, things move really fast, in part because you can do that in animation. Like, if you if you have just like an entire animated episode, like the characters can move like nonstop if if that's what you want them to. Where if you're making the the same thing with like human actors live action. Like every so often, like they, they gotta take take a breather, and it's also I think it's also like doesn't it get more uncomfortable if we're watching if we're if we're watching live action and they're just always moving? I I think I heard that somewhere that that gets to be excessive also. But yeah, like the there's always something going on in in both of these episodes. The it's never just like standing still, and and yet somehow they do manage to have moments that like hit the the you know uh i don't know if i i'm not sure if it's fair to call them slower moments but in the first episode when the the yeah for example at the end when she says we won the war and you've got the bit where like let's see what she yeah she's she's drinking and trying to you know and she's noting can't get drunk and in this episode, when T'Challa realizes that Yondu lied about Wakanda being destroyed, and the let's see, there was one, at least one other moment that I wanted to bring up, and yeah, another thing I like that you know, like when he got put in the box, I was like. How is he going to get out of here? And then, you know, it turns out that let's see if I recall, it it was like the the he's got the thing around the the what's it called? Uh necklace. He's got that thing and it's got the the sharp bits and he uses that to punch through the glass. That was a quite clever because Collector doesn't, like, he's, he wants him in mint condition. He's not going to start, like, pulling stuff off the, you know, which we also do see the the various people that he's got in box, the, the beings that he's got in boxes, like, they still look the way that you would expect them to look. Like, yeah, he didn't really take anything. Yeah. That is everything. So, yeah, really... Really excited for the next one, and yeah, you know when 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 I talked about the first episode last week, I mentioned that 
the first episode was just them starting like they they just they just want to wet your beak they just want to show this is the concept you know don't be scared but this you know we're we're going to take stories you've seen and we're going to we're going to change up stuff okay just don't don't freak out now and we're going to have an entire episode where it's basically just they 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 swapped around Steve and Peggy you know there's not a huge difference like they still win the war Red, the story ends with red skull you know being destroyed because a portal was opened into to space and then you know the 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 captain ends up in present day in front of Nick Fury like but then with this you know now that people have been like oh, okay so i get it now i you know then in this one they just go completely crazy with it and like this is not just you know okay let's have the first Guardians movie, or the second one, but T'Challa instead of Peter Will. It's hugely different. You know, the the there's a bunch of elements from from the movies, but it remixes them into something completely different. The you know, we we've had heist stories before. The the first now I'm blanking on is the second one also? But anyway, yeah, the first Ant-Man movie is a heist story. So we've had that sort of thing before. But, you know, in addition, like, it brings in elements. It, it, it's not a surprise that it brings in elements from both of the Guardians movies. But then it also brings in stuff from, like, Infinity War. You know, the, the Thanos and the Black Order. Like, Thanos very briefly appears in the first Guardians movie, but he never gets off that chair. That was the joke for, for years. Like, if Thanos doesn't get off that chair soon, you know, and then Infinity War hit and nobody remembered anymore that they were upset that Thanos hadn't... That, that it took a while for, for Thanos to, to really make a mark in the MCU, but with good cause. Both the both the impatience and the the acceptance that he was amazing, but but yeah, like they they did a a really great job bringing in all of these and and just completely remixing. Like I could imagine there might be some more casual fans who watched this and were like, "That is that was way too much, way too fast," you know. But if you're watching it, that means you have Disney Plus, and if you have Disney Plus. Then you have access to the entire MCU, so you know. I don't think I don't think Disney is like, uh, oh ah, uh, did we make it so that you stay on Disney Plus and stream our stuff for longer? Oh wow, I didn't didn't see that one coming, but I there you go, you know. Just yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're happy about it. The the stock, ah. What are, they, what are they called again? Stockholders are quite happy with with this, but yeah, that is it for for this one. So I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.